Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 43. Today I'm going to open up a new series on the various biomes that define planet Earth. Whereas in the last series I explored the fundamentals of ecology, in this series I'm going to apply those fundamentals to specific habitats and environments in the real world. We're going to dive right in and explore how specific habitats and specific ecosystems function, what resources they have available, what species live there, and how those species act and interact to create stable communities, how they perpetuate their biome. After all, once you've moved beyond the base physical environment, a biome is defined by the life that lives there, by how that life grows and reproduces, how it finds food or evades predators, how it moves resources across geographic space or through the trophic food web. It goes without saying that ecology is pretty complex, so it should follow that biomes are also pretty complex. With that said, I want to start the series by exploring the biome where life first came into existence, where life first appeared and started replicating. I want to talk about the oceans. The oceans are the predominant habitat on planet Earth. They cover more than 70% of the surface. They provide a volume of habitat on the order of 1.35 billion cubic kilometers, larger than any other habitat on the planet. And the oceans are, as an ecosystem with the world's biosphere, absolutely critical for the existence and vitality of all the rest of Earth's life. The oceans are major players in the water cycle, as well as other geochemical cycles like that of carbon and nitrogen. Alright, let's start at the beginning by asking a simple question. What is an ocean? In the most fundamental terms that I can think of, an ocean is a large body of salt water, or saline water, unbounded by land in the way that a sea, a bay, an inlet, or other bodies of water typically are. Oceans can be understood as a collection of layers, or regions, defined by variables like temperature, pressure, and the availability of nutrients and light. When I say the word ocean, you probably imagine a huge blue expanse of water, extending out to a flat horizon in all directions. This kind of open ocean, on the surface, is called the pelagic zone. It's the region of the ocean that's just open water, it's not close to any land, and it's far above the ocean floor and the continental shelf. The uppermost layer of the pelagic zone is called the epipelagic, with the prefix epi meaning above or outside. In this case, the epipelagic zone is uh, simply the uppermost layer of the open ocean, beginning at the surface of the water and descending down about 200 meters. Because the pelagic zone has direct contact with the atmosphere, oxygen is readily dissolved into the water, and this helps support life. The pelagic zone can also be called the photic zone, because it's the only part of the ocean where light can penetrate. Because the deeper parts of the ocean are too dark, the epipelagic zone is the only part of the open ocean where photosynthesis can take place. It's the only place where photosynthetic species can live, because it's the only place where they can actually access light. If they go any deeper, the light is just blocked by the water. It's too dark. But it's not just photosynthetic organisms, though. The light provides warmth or visual information for many other aquatic species like dolphins and sharks that tend to prefer staying in the epipelagic zone. Extending another 800 meters immediately below this is the mesopelagic zone, also known as the twilight zone, because the last glimmers of light barely penetrate deep enough to reach this layer. While there's some light, it isn't enough for photosynthesis. Furthermore, because it's further from the ocean surface, there's a lot less oxygen in the water. Organisms that live here have had to evolve adaptations to deal with the lower oxygen content, like an aquatic analog to the terrestrial organisms that had to adapt to the low oxygen content at high altitudes. The organisms that live in the mesopelagic zone have adapted to this lower oxygen content by developing larger or more efficient gills than it, that can extract as much oxygen as possible out of the water. Other species kind of went a, a different evolutionary route, Instead of evolving more efficient gills, they instead evolved to conserve their precious oxygen by moving as little as possible. Below the mesopelagic zone is the bathypelagic zone, which exists between 1,000 and 4,000 meters in depth. This is so deep that no light makes it down here. Photosynthesis is entirely out of the question. It's impossible, because it's, it's just too dark. 
Besides the bodies of the macroscopic organisms, which are few and far between, the only food that exists in the bathypelagic zone is the little bits of detritus, the decaying flesh and rotting tissue that rains down from the upper layers of the ocean. Where sharks and tuna and other predator fish will kill other fish and rip apart their bodies in the course of getting a meal, they make a huge mess. Guts and blood and gore is thrown all over the place, and chunks of flesh torn free from the animal rain down from the site of the kill. These fleshy chunks and bits of blood and gore, uh, they're actually called marine snow, because, because it kind of looks like snow when it's slowly raining down to the deeper depths of the ocean. This marine snow blankets the ocean floor, and as it descends down through the ocean, it feeds the biomes and the organisms that live there, and it settles and accumulates on the ocean floor, where it feeds more organisms. The bathypelagic zone is often visited by the giant squid. The zone also gets penetrated by the deepest dives of the giant squid's natural predator, the sperm whale. Whales actually play a really important role in the oceanic biome, both in the upper zones where they live and breathe, and even in the lower zones and on the sea floor. There's a really awesome phenomenon that happens here called a whale fall. When a whale or another large animal dies, two things can happen to its body. Either the corpse stays at the surface, or it falls to the ocean floor in a whale fall. When the corpse stays near the surface, buoyed by the gases produced during decomposition, it's usually consumed pretty quickly. The vast bulk of marine species live near the surface, so they all get a chance to feed off of the whale's body, as do birds and other terrestrial animals that happen to dwell near the coast. The high temperature, the exposure to sunlight, and the exposure to oxygen all accelerate the molecular decomposition considerably. And after a few days or weeks, the corpse is pretty much stripped bone. All the flesh is gone. But on the other hand, sometimes the whale's body doesn't float. Sometimes the whale dies in colder, denser water, where the temperature slows decomposition, and the gases produced by this slowed decomposition are just absorbed by the denser ambient water, which causes the corpse to sink. As the whale carcass sinks, the cold temperatures prevent it from decaying rapidly. As the carcass slowly falls to the ocean floor, it becomes a place of interest for all manner of organisms, from scavengers to microbes. The carcass becomes like a temporary organic city, an isolated ecosystem, all built around the huge mass of organic material dropping into an otherwise barren marine landscape. In time, the carcass falls to the ocean floor, where its subsequent deconstruction feeds nearby organisms for years. First, the corpse gets attacked by larger, mobile scavengers like sharks and hagfish, which dig into the soft tissue and rip out chunks of flesh to eat. During this initial feeding phase, the whale carcass can lose more than 50 kilograms, or more than 100 pounds of flesh in a day. After enough time of being violently ripped apart, the decomposition process enters the second stage. At this point, the bones of the whale carcass are exposed, and bits and pieces of its flesh are scattered all over the surrounding area. It's like the residual mess made by these larger scavengers as they just rip apart the body. For more than a year, various scavengers and opportunists will come to the site of the whale carcass, and they'll feed off of the residual meat left on the bones, as well as the gristle and gunk left behind by the larger carnivores. The mineral sediment on the ocean floor surrounding the carcass is enriched by the organics that have been thrown around everywhere, and organisms can also come in and feed off of that stuff. This eventually leads to the final stage, when there's not much left besides the bones. Sulfophilic bacteria migrate into the bone tissue, where they can access and anaerobically digest the fat that's kept hidden in the bone marrow. This last stage, where the chemolithic bacteria eat away at the residual fats, can last for the better part of a century. The takeaway point here is that the whale carcass takes quite a while to be fully digested, on the scale of years. And with around 700,000 whale falls or carcasses existing in the ocean at any given time, these massive piles of organic material each represent an oasis of food and nutrients in an otherwise barren and desolate void. Naturally, the creatures of the deeper ocean, of the bathypelagic and abyssopelagic zones, they swarm to these dead whales, and they form tightly focused ecological communities around them. In regions where whales are highly concentrated, like along a migration route or in a mating area, 
The whale falls that hit the ocean floor may be close enough together that these species of scavengers and opportunists can actually reproduce and their offspring are able to travel to a new carcass for new or fresh, I guess, dead meat. In this way, the bodies of dead whales create nutrient nodes studding the ocean floor, and the species of worm and crustacean and fish that feed on them can actually sustain a delicate ecosystem that perpetuates itself like a fungus or a bacterial culture by focusing their growth in the areas with the most available nutrients. Because you got to understand, you got these whale falls, these whale carcasses, which are these massive piles of super highly concentrated nutrients. But beyond them, you know, just the regular ocean floor, it's just, it's kind of a, a barren, sandy muck. Yeah, I mean, you have like this accumulated gooey layer of all of the residual detritus that's been raining down over the entirety of the ocean for, you know, millions of years. But it mixes with sand and it's kind of mucky and gooey and there's only a select handful of organisms that can really harvest nutrients from, from that muck very well. For the most part, it's pretty much a giant barren landscape that's penetrated by these, these oases of nutrients. Whales breathe and hang out in the epipelagic zone. They live in the mesopelagic zone and sometimes the bathypelagic zone. And when they die, their bodies sometimes sink 4,000 meters down into the abyssopelagic, or the abyssal zone. The abyssal zone is truly the abyss. It's the deepest part of the open ocean where there's no light at all. The ambient temperature is a chilly 2 to 3 degrees Celsius, which is about 35 to 37 degrees Fahrenheit. The pressure can reach about 11,000 pounds per square inch, which is so high, it's like every square inch of your body being pressed on by the weight of four mid-sized cars. You'd get crushed into dust pretty much instantly. The life that lives down here is strange, almost alien. Most species are blind even eyeless, having no need for light-sensing organs in a world that's never seen light in millions of years. Because they can't see or be seen, they have no need for pigmentation. Their bodies are pale, to the point of being translucent. The abyssal zone includes most of the ocean floor, like 99.8% of it, but it gives way at a depth of about 6,000 meters to the hadopelagic zone, or the haddle zone. This is a zone only found in deep ocean trenches, which can extend from the ocean floor down some 5,000 meters into the crust. These trenches are deep, and they're long, running hundreds if not thousands of kilometers along the ocean floor. Life in the Haddle Zone is slightly denser than the areas of open ocean above it, because the geography creates a tapering crevice where detritus can accumulate. The organisms that live down here are all accustomed to the immense pressure and total darkness, including tube worms, sea cucumbers, sea spiders, prawns, and jellyfish. The primary food source for these macroscopic organisms is the marine snow that rains on them from above, accumulating at the bottom of their crevice. As I said a moment ago, virtually the entire ocean floor between the continental plates uh, what's called the abyssal plain, is covered in a partly organic layer of muck and sludge, composed of detritus and sand. This is a quasi-biological substrate that can feed the scavengers and filter feeders on the bottom. The only natural light that exists in the depths of the bathypelagic, the abyssopelagic, and the hadopelagic zones comes from bioluminescent organisms, like the anglerfish with their forehead-mounted lures, and the barbel dragonfish with their illuminated scales. The rest of the species at these depths, be they pale blind fish, sea spiders with legs more than two and a half feet in diameter, or some kind of crab, prawn, or clam, they live their lives in virtually total darkness. There are other biological communities that exist at these depths, but they're microscopic, microbial. They live independent of the heat of the sun or any chemicals produced in the wider ocean. These microbial communities live in the deep sea hydrothermal vents that dot the borders of continental plates, feeding off of the sulfuric compounds that get expelled from the rifts between moving tectonic plates. These thermophilic and sulfurphilic microbes, typically bacteria, can live in these extreme environments making them remarkably unique species in the deepest depths of the ocean. All told, there are some 230,000 species known to live in the oceans, coming from a wide variety of clades and lineages. An obvious example is the paraphyletic lineage called fish. 
as the oceans are literally teeming with fish. Canadarian species like jellyfish also thrive in the oceans, as do cephalopods like squid and octopus, crustaceans like crab and lobster, echinoderms like starfish and sea cucumbers, marine mammals called cetaceans like whales and dolphins, as well as billions of smaller organisms like worms, nematodes, and plankton. Plankton are particularly fascinating ocean-dwelling creatures that I want to explore in a little more detail. The term plankton doesn't actually refer to any specific species or lineage. Plankton is a general term that refers to the many microbes and microorganisms floating in the water, whether they be algae, protozoa, bacteria, or archaea. Because plankton are so small, they can't swim laterally against the current. They generally exist as a diffuse cloud of organisms scattered throughout the ocean water. Plankton belong in an ecological niche that makes them the basis of their marine food chain, much like the primary producers are for uh, terrestrial habitats. Also like primary producers on land, the plankton in the ocean have a critical part to play in carbon and oxygen cycling. There are numerous species of photosynthetic plankton called phytoplankton, and these live in the epipelagic zone, or the photic zone, where they can access light and perform photosynthesis. More than that, the chemical product of their photosynthetic respiration is molecular oxygen. This molecular oxygen diffuses through the water, and it enables other organisms like fish to breathe. In fact, the mass oxygen production of all of these phytoplankton has been the stabilizing factor in the CO2 and O2 balance in the atmosphere for literally hundreds of millions of years. In this way, the phytoplankton are a lot like land plants. They produce the oxygen needed for the animals around them to breathe and survive. Anyways, zooplankton, or microscopic animals, then come along and eat the phytoplankton, much like how herbivores come along and eat plants. These zooplankton act as primary consumers, bringing the carbon in the bodies of the primary producers into the food chain. They distribute this carbon by breathing out CO2, or by getting eaten by some larger organism, or by dying, sinking, and having their body decay on the ocean floor. Just as they play a critical role in chemical cycling, plankton play a critical role in the food web for larger, more complex organisms like fish. The fish life cycle begins with larvae breaking out of the yolk sac, or the egg, and swimming around in open water, which is kind of dangerous for them. The fish larvae are small, they're weak and inexperienced, they don't really have the physical capacity to hunt down and kill anything larger or more sophisticated than plankton. What this means, ecologically, is that the perpetuation of fish populations is highly dependent on the density of plankton. If the density is too low, then the fish will have produced more larvae than the habitat can support, and some percentage of them will starve. If the plankton in an area are entirely wiped out or killed off, local fish populations will crash as the newest generation of larvae starve and die off. Fish are a hugely diverse paraphyletic group of species that live at every depth in the ocean, from the epipelagic to the hadopelagic. Fish live on the continental shelves that extend outward, nearly 500 kilometers from the shore, mostly submerged except for the terrain that sits above sea level. The water above a continental shelf is relatively shallow compared to the open ocean, but at the edges of the shelf there's a steep slope that descends into the abyssal plain. Because the continental shelves are so elevated and so close to the surface of the ocean, they often receive enough sunlight to feed a much denser biota of photosynthetic organisms that would ever be possible in the deeper ocean. As I've said before, the density of primary producers in a habitat is a key factor limiting the size of the ecosystem that can feed off of them. This means that these marine areas with access to sunlight are really fertile for life because they can sustain viable populations of marine plants. And these plants go on to feed herbivores, which feed secondary consumers, and those feed tertiary consumers, and so on and so forth. Pretty much all kinds of life are more common on the continental shelves. The majority of fish species live here, as do marine arthropods and crustaceans. Corals exist with much higher abundance on the shelf than on the abyssal plain, and the primary producers that are virtually non-existent in the open ocean are able to thrive on the continental shelves. Some of these primary producers are kelp plants, and when they grow together they form kelp forests, which are some of the most dynamic and complex ecosystems on the planet. Kelp plants anchored to the ocean floor rise up like trees, buoyed by the water and held up to the ocean surface. 
In many cases, a mass of floating kelp will form a mobile habitat platform. In large numbers, kelp forests look really similar to terrestrial forests, although slightly alien in their physiology, and of course, totally submerged in water. Kelp in a kelp forest really does act a lot like trees do in a land forest. They're photosynthetic, they produce oxygen, and they create a three-dimensional habitat with a vertical element, which other organisms use for shelter or protection. This also creates distinct regions within the habitat, like a canopy region at the top, which gets the most sunlight, increasingly shaded areas at deeper and deeper depths, and the ocean floor that looks like a dark forest as it's deeply shaded by all the floating biomass above it, and it's studded with the pillar-like stems of the individual kelp as they anchor to the ground and come upwards. The ecologies and food webs created in kelp forests work much like they do on dry land. Herbivorous species like kelp crabs, isopods, sea urchins, and various fish will feed off of the kelp, eating the leafy fronds and occasionally using them to hide from predators. These predators, be they otters, lobsters, carnivorous fish, or whatever else, have been experimentally shown to be critical top-down regulators of a kelp forest ecosystem. You see, there are many herbivore species that would just eat away at the kelp with reckless abandon if they could. Fortunately for the kelp forest, the numbers of these herbivores are regulated by the presence of predators that eat them. This has been demonstrated with sea urchins. You know, the sea urchins eat the kelp for food. Uh, in the forests off of the coast of Alaska, sea otters are the dominant predator, and they come in and they eat the sea urchins. By eating the sea urchins, the otters keep their numbers from growing out of control. But if you remove the otters from their Alaskan kelp forests, the sea urchins don't have to worry about predation anymore. You could say that they're released from their predation risk, and they grow and reproduce fearlessly. The exploding sea urchin population eats way more of the kelp than they usually do, and this leads to a direct deconstruction of the physical habitat. This can lead to the expulsion of numerous other species that live in the kelp forest, which causes a general degradation in the vitality and biodiversity of the kelp forest ecosystem. This general principle has been experimentally observed not just in Alaska, but also off the coasts of Southern California, Australia, Eastern Canada, Chile, and South Africa. Another type of complex ecology in the ocean takes the form of a coral reef. Coral reefs are pretty amazing things, because they serve as a home to more than 25% of life in the oceans, despite covering less than 0.1% of the ocean floor. The typical coral reef is created by corals, which are sessile colonies of animals uh, composed of filter-feeding polyps. Many species of coral excrete calcium carbonate to form an exoskeleton, which gives them protection and physical support. As corals typically grow in groups or communities, their exoskeletons will often fuse together and grow over each other, and over time they perpetuate to create a giant mass of aquatic bone. This mass is the substrate for more coral, as well as huge numbers of other aquatic species, like sponges, tunicates, and other sessile canadarians. These immobile organisms create the physical architecture of the coral reef, which become a home for thousands of species of fish, like the clownfish that live within the stinging tentacles of a sea anemone, as well as worms, eels, prawns, crabs, lobsters, and mollusks like snails and octopus. The coral reef acts like an oasis of life, bursting out of an otherwise barren ocean floor. Where kelp forests typically exist in colder water with frequent nutrient upwelling caused by currents and temperature gradients, coral reefs are typically found within a broad equatorial band that reaches as far north as Mexico, Saudi Arabia, and India, and as far south as Madagascar, Brazil, and the northern half of Australia. The corals are delicate and they can't survive in marine habitats outside of this range. A temperature of 26 to 27 degrees Celsius is ideal for coral, but most corals can't tolerate temperatures far outside of that range. One of the effects of climate change is impeding the ability of corals to produce their calcium carbonate exoskeletons, which is degrading their long-term stability. Corals are also very sensitive to nutrient availability, and they typically rely on symbiotes to get the nutrients they need. If there's fluctuations in the population or efficacy of these symbiotes, it can have serious downstream effects on the health of the coral reef. Perhaps the most important of these symbiotes is the photosynthetic algae Zoosanthalea. 
Because the zooxanthellae are photosynthetic and depend on access to sunlight, and the coral reefs are dependent on the zooxanthellae for most of their chemical energy, coral reefs tend to concentrate in the photic zones of the ocean, where their symbiotes can access as much light as possible. To sustain the symbiotic relationship, the corals filter feed plankton out of the water and digest their bodies in, into nitrogen and carbon-containing compounds, and these compounds get shared with the zooxanthellae. In return, they give the coral energy-rich nutrients like glycerol, glucose, and amino acids for building proteins. The corals are also fed by the species that live on top of them. All those organisms eat food, and things that eat will produce waste, which gets excreted. Carnivorous fish excrete the remains of other fish, while herbivorous fish excrete the remains of marine plants. Sponges are actually really important for the health of a coral reef because sponges are really efficient filter feeders that collect plankton from the ocean water, and they digest them down to their base chemicals, and they excrete this waste into crevices in the coral. This waste from the sponges builds up into a nutrient-rich sediment deposit that the coral reefs pretty much have perpetual contact with. In many cases, the seafloor surrounding a coral reef is covered in meadows of seagrass, or the shoreline might possess mangrove forests. These examples of marine vegetation are essentially giant pools of nitrogen. When the seagrass or the mangrove trees die and decay, their nutrient-rich bodies, like uh, particularly rich in nitrogen, dissolve into the ocean and they increase the local concentration of nitrogen that's available for the coral reef. This goes as well for the, uh, for the species of grazing animals that feed off of these plants and then excrete their waste into the local area, or they die and their bodies decompose. And all of these acts release nutrients into the ocean water. And as long as you have this ambient level of nutrients kind of floating through the water, the filter feeders and the coral reefs are going to do just fine. The mangrove forests are themselves really fascinating habitats with a pronounced influence on the maritime ecology of their habitats. But I'll get into more detail about this in my next episode on swamps, wetlands, and river biomes. As for the oceans as a biome for life, I think I've covered that in enough detail. To summarize this episode, the oceans are a conglomeration of dynamic and finely tuned habitats, tightly regulated in all areas by the availability of nutrients and sunlight. In the ocean depths, life is rare and dispersed because of the lack of nutrients. But in the event of a whale fall, the deep sea denizens congregate en masse to get a bit of nutrients from the huge rotting carcass. In shallow water, like on a continental shelf, the ocean floor is much more exposed to light. And this allows for the proliferation of marine vegetation like seagrass, kelp forests, and mangroves. The choppy, agitated water that exists near the continental shelf is also ideal for corals, as it shakes up the water enough to give them a steady stream of dissolved nutrients. These corals form communities called reefs, which act as biological hubs with thousands of species flourishing in an otherwise desolate ocean floor. There's a fascinating symmetry with life in the oceans and life on land, with both marine and terrestrial plants performing the same fundamental ecological roles, like producing oxygen, acting as a primary producer, and providing a vertical dimension that turns the 2D ocean floor into a three-dimensional habitat. Aquatic predators and herbivores share the same kind of ecological roles as their land-based counterparts, all working together to keep the ecosystems viable and healthy. All right, that should about wrap it all up. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope you found something in it that caused your brain to light up in excitement and curiosity. I hope you learned something about how life in the oceans uh, works, and how it all depends on finely tuned chemical and geophysical processes like nutrient cycling, currents, temperature gradients, and light availability. In the next episode, I'll move further inland by exploring the coastlines, the wetlands and swamps and marshes, the lakes and rivers and inland seas of the planet, and the life forms that live within them and the ecologies that they create. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below. Thank you.